Well, good evening. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, week, what is this, three? Week three of uh, CG Collective. Um, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to get into tools for discipleship tonight. That's the main subject for tonight. Uh, but let me pray. Lord Jesus, I ask for your blessing and power upon our uh, time tonight, whether it be through, the, uh, through this teaching um, and also the discussions we have tonight at our tables. Uh, bless us now, Lord. Uh, Jesus, may you be made much of. May we be equipped to make disciples who make disciples. In your name I pray, amen. So a little recap, the, uh, we've been focusing on discipleship. Jesus said uh, in the Great Commission, go and make disciples. And so that's the mission and vision of our church. The mission of our church is to make dedicated disciples of Jesus. We want to see citywide transformation, uh, spiritually, socially, culturally, through the gospel of Jesus. That's the vision of our church. We believe that is done primarily through uh, discipleship, uh, the Great Commission, making dedicated disciples of Jesus. And so Jesus said, Matthew 28, go and make disciples. Pretty simple, uh, but, uh, but, but it's, it's been profound. There's a movement that started when Jesus said, all authority in heaven has been given to me, go and make disciples. It started a movement, a worldwide movement that we're, that we're still participating in even today. And so we've talked about it that uh, uh, discipleship is made up of three things. First is evangelism. So meaning that when Jesus says, go make disciples, there are people who don't know Jesus that need to meet Jesus and be- begin to follow him. That's the first part. Uh, make disciples uh, implies that there would be a, a category of evangelism, that individual Christians would seek out non-Christians uh, where they live, work, and play and share the good news about who Jesus is to them so that they may come into a personal relationship with Jesus. At that point, they're baptized. Uh, Jesus says in the Great Commission to baptize. And then the third part of the Great Commission is to teach obedience. Jesus says it this way, that we should teach uh, uh, others, to those who we're discipling, to observe all that he has commanded. And he, he promises that in doing so, he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And so this is the, the great commission to make disciples, introduce people to Jesus, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to continue to obey Jesus. So if you're a Christian, someone shared the gospel with you, they evangelized you, you became a Christian, you were baptized, and now the rest of your life is, is one of obedience. And so we've talked about this before. We're either teaching others to obey and we are obeying, learning to continually obey ourselves. So there's two. There's personal discipleship, growth spiritually, and then helping others continue to walk and follow Jesus as well. We talked about the spheres of where that discipleship plays out. And we, we, we framed it this way, everyday life. Uh, what that means is where we live, where we work, where we play, where you geographically live, uh, where you work, those people you're around there, and where you hang out. Maybe, that may be, for some of you, uh, sports for your kids. Right now, you don't, you're like, I don't hang out anywhere, but I take my kids to uh, baseball. And that is your, maybe where you play. But those are spheres. We talked about last week, what, what do we do in those spheres, uh, in, in those areas, those arenas? We follow Jesus. That's the goal. We're trying to follow Jesus. We're there. We want to be a great. We want to be the most. The, the, we want to be an example of Jesus while we're there. Where we live, work, and play, we want to be an example of Jesus. The same example we would be in our home. We want to be at the, the baseball field or at work, wherever we're at. We want to be an example of Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. Additionally, uh, we want to continue to fight sin, namely indwelling sin. That may be in community. That may be interpersonally. That may be in relationships with others. But even when we're out in public. It tends to be arenas and spheres where sin is, is exposed, insecurities are, are seen, uh, sin seizes opportunities. We have opportunities to, to repent of those sins by the grace of God and, and fight sin. And then third, fulfill the mission. The mission of what? Discipleship. So it just it repeats itself there. So tonight what we're going to do is look at uh, the tools for discipleship. But before we get to the, the tools, I want us to see that discipleship is training. I want us to use, I want to, I'm going to change vernacular to, to go from discipleship, the word discipleship, to, to training. Where we get that from is in 1 Timothy 4, uh, starting in verse 7. Uh, this is rather, the Apostle Paul t- telling Timothy, rather train, or some of your translations may say discipline. Train or discipline, they're they're the same word. Train or discipline yourselves for godliness. That is, verse 7, that is the, I want us to see here that we are, as Christians, as disciples, we are to train ourselves for the purpose of godliness. He says, for while bodily training has some value, he says, hey, it's good to exercise, good to go to the gym, 
good to have a diet. That's really, really good. You should do that. But also, here's a better idea. If you, if you do that, great. But you should also train for godliness. Because godliness is a value in every way. How many ways? Every way. As it, as it holds promise for the present life and also to the life to come. So in this life, discipleship matters. Being disciplined matters for the purpose of godliness. And so I want us to see that as a disciple, that implies discipline. That's what the word means. Like literally the word discipline, put it next to the word disciple. Some of you, if you're dyslexic like me, you spell them the exact same way because the, the letters are the same. So I, I'm literally looking at it going, I don't know which one's which. Um, and so training, discipleship, they're the same. In our world today, we don't like discipline. We don't like the word discipline. We, 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 it usually, uh, in our minds, we think of something uh, negative. Discipline is negative. Uh, there is a growing philosophy among some that discipline equals freedom that actually is taken from the Bible, and this is where you see it here. That, uh, and what we mean by this is, is actually that when you are disciplined, you have more freedom. Meaning that if you are disciplined or trained, let's say in the art of uh, I don't know, playing the piano, something I don't, I'm not trained in. Uh, what, what, what would first take discipline to learn the keys, learn how, learn how to read music, learn how to play? It, it's grueling. It's, it's hard. It, 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 maybe it's guitar. Maybe it's an instrument. Maybe it's even a sport or a skill. What at first is really hard later becomes freeing and fun when you know how to play it. So whether it be the piano, the guitar, whatever instrument it may be, or maybe it's a sport. Like I remember in, in the various sports I played, once I learned how, not just the rules of the sport, how to play a sport, what was disciplined and skilled and trained in the sport, I loved playing, uh, for example, basketball. I could go play a pickup game of basketball, and it was fun. I had a lot of fun. I was free to play the sport because I was trained and disciplined in the sport. The better I got in, at my training, the more disciplined I, I got at my sport, the better I was at the craft, the more fun, the more free that sport was. The same is true about discipleship. The same is th- true about godliness. The same is true about our relationship with God. Many of us, we think about, for example, prayer or our relationship with God in, in various ways, and we find all the ways that we fall short. We'll then look at someone who's, who's maybe more mature in faith or they've been walking with Jesus longer, and they'll, you'll go, man, you just make that look so easy. What, what might look easy to someone that, that isn't easy for you in the present may simply be the difference of discipline, training. And so when we, when we think about sports or you think about the craft, whatever you've done where you've disciplined yourself in order to achieve something, some of you that's studying, you wanted to be a doctor, a nurse, you wanted to be something, so you put in the work, the discipline to study, to train yourself so that it would one day produce results, fruit, freedom. You can enjoy the thing that you've been training for. For us, he's saying this, it's really good to, to value uh, bodily training, uh, exercise, all these types of training. Those are all great things. But hey, uh, godliness, training for godliness has, has value in every area of our life. It gets the most important thing. And so in an undisciplined world, God is calling his people to be disciplined for the purpose of godliness. To, as the Great Commission says, this, to be a disciple, to obey what God has commanded. And so in doing so, the more we walk with Jesus, the more we're disciplined in our relationship with the the Lord God, the more free we are in our relationship with him. The more prayer becomes maybe more accessible. Let's put it another way. Christianity is a relationship. It is. Imagine you, you having a friend, a spouse, or someone who you just enjoy being around and they're a friend to you. Um, it, relationships take discipline. They take effort. If you, who are married, uh, never talk to your spouse, never talked about your problems, just let everything just go as it is, let bitterness grow in your heart, never dealt with any of those things, what would happen? Like That relationship would break. It would fall apart. But the more you were disciplined in, in talking about maybe uh, c- your communication, the more disciplined you were in talking about your expectations, the more disciplined you were about growing together in oneness, the more free, more liberated, more enjoyable your relationship would be. If you simply just ignored it all, it would just get worse and worse and worse. But so, so, let me, so when it comes to our relationship with the Lord Jesus, we should gladly seek to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. In the same way we gladly discipline ourselves in our sport, in our craft, our career, our job, our instrument, whatever it is. 
And so that's what this text is saying, that, that there's this training, there's this discipline for godliness that, that we are called to do ourselves uh, that has, has much value and it has promise in this life and in the life to come. It's not just practically in the present, practical in the present, but it's, it's beneficial for eternity. Additionally, what I want us to see is that motives matter. Why are we doing this? It's for the purpose of godliness. We want to be like Jesus. Like, it's not to earn God, not to earn righteousness. It's not to earn God's love for you. It's not to earn anything. We discipline or train ourselves for godliness because we are loved. It matters. Motive, our motives here matter because we can wrongly engage in training for godliness and, and be really disappointed when we do so based off of learning or trying to earn someone's approval, earn favor from God. But rather we, we, we discipline ourselves because we've been loved, because we've been accepted, because we've been approved by God through, the, through Jesus Christ, through his, his work on the cross, through his resurrection. And so part of discipleship, part of disciplining ourselves for the purpose of godliness is, is, is also to remember, our, remember that, that we are recipients of grace. We're disciplined in recalling God's grace. That's part of like we need to. Some of us really need to grow in uh, remembering and reminding ourselves and disciplining ourselves to be reminded of why God has saved you, or that He has saved you, that you are a child of God, that your sins have been atoned for, that you have been forgiven. Some of you that may need to be the first thing you remember every single day because you've forgotten that so much and you live your life in condemnation. And I want us to see that training for godliness here in this text is the same thing as the Great Commission. Jesus says he wants to, he he commissions his disciples to teach one another to observe all that Christ has commanded. Another way to say that is train yourself for the purpose of godliness. That's exactly what we see in this text. And so let's look at now the tools for discipleship. I think there's 17 of them. 17 tools, and so I brought some books uh, that, uh, that most of these are referenced from. These are highly recommended books. I'll talk about them a little more uh, as I wrap this thing up. But uh, tools for discipleship, number one. Um, so th- remember, these tools are to help us follow Jesus. These are, these are tools to help us to continue to fight sin. These are help us to fulfill the mission. These are tools to help us be disciples. So the, the, number one, it's the discipline of Bible reading. How can we grow in Christ's likeness if we don't read our Bible? Real simple here. God wrote a book, and he told us everything we need to know for the purpose of life and godliness. That's what the word of God is. He's given it. He's spoken to us. He wants you to know who he is and, how he, and what his character is like. And he gives some commands. He gives some principles. He gives a lot of things to help us walk in his word, his will, and his ways in godliness. First thing, reading our Bible. Second thing, the discipline of applying Bible, the Bible. So it was, some of us are really good at remembering and reading. We're like really good readers. We, we memorize a lot of things or, or we remember a lot that we read and we have a lot of information. But it may not, if we don't apply it, then there's no transformation. Some of you want the Bible, you know, be in your, your, your church growing up and you can quote a bunch of verses. And I remember like I was playing, I was in, I was in a church and like I could quote all these verses and you got these stars for doing it and all these rewards. And it's awesome. Cool. But no one ever taught us, I mean, they probably did, we weren't listening, to apply what we were memorizing, what we were reading. But, uh, I'll say it this way, and this will be controversial, but it'll be okay. Bible uh, reading, Bible intake, script, studying the scriptures without application is abortion. That's what it is. It's what, literally what it is. It is. What we're doing there is what we're, we're taking information. We're, we're actually taking something that is, is uh, full of life and gives life. And we're killing it by not applying it. That's literally what we're doing when we don't apply our Bible reading. Next, Bible study. So there's not just reading. You can read for, for, under, for understanding big themes and ideas in the Bible. We can apply those things. But sometimes it takes us time to study the Bible. We need to study it. We need to, under, to, to maybe do an in-depth study to understand maybe the context. So a lot of preaching, when we preach on Sunday... We're trying to uh, help us study, help us learn, help us to, to know how to study the Bible. Next is prayer. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. That's what it is. If you want a relationship with anybody, you got to talk to them. So disciplining ourselves for the purpose of prayer, uh, or for prayer, is for the purpose of godliness. Like, 
We want to, if you, you, you knew this, when you're growing up and you have some friends and you hung out with them all the time, you had conversations with them, you started dressing like them, wearing their clothes because they were cool, or maybe you were the cool guy and other people started copying you. I remember I went to a school where it was heavily uh, gang influenced, and so I started starching my jeans like, the, like the, the gang dudes did, and so I thought that was cool, and I wore, uh, you know, clothes that they wore, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to be like them. That's what I wanted to do. That's what everyone else did. But it, it, it came through a relationship. Relationships have conversations. If you want to be like Jesus, you want to be godly, and you want to grow in your relationship with God, you have to be a person of prayer. And this is perhaps the, the, the number one thing that people struggle with, uh, would, would admit to struggling with in the church is prayer. I'll say this on prayer. Prayer is simply you just talking to God. You processing your pain with God. Process, literally, those who of you who are verbal processors, just say everything you're thinking out loud to God in prayer. Like that, or in your mind. Don't say it. You, know, you can be silent in prayer. If you're, if you're around other people, you can be loud in your car. Just whatever. God, I just need you to know this. A good place to start on how to pray would be the, the Psalms in the Bible. Pray those things. There's times where the psalmist, like David, is like, I'm angry in God. I hate these people, and they hate me. They hate you. Can you crush their heads? Like, he just says some things that, you know, probably you wouldn't hear in church. The point is here that David is honest with God in prayer. He's not always right about what he's praying about. He's honest in prayer. If you want some language to, to help you understand how to pray, the Psalms are a really good place to start. But it's a conversation between you and God. God speaks through his word. That's why we have Bible reading, Bible study, Bible application. Prayer is us communicating back to God. Next, corporate worship. Our lives as Christians, as disciples, as godly men and women are to be uh, lives of worship. So we do that. One of the disciplines is we, uh, we gather together. Hebrews tells us not to forsake the gathering, the corporate gathering of believers. Sometimes that takes discipline. Sometimes you show up. I don't know how many, how many times I've heard this, and you've probably experienced it. You're like, I did not want to show up to church, but I showed up and God had a word for me. It was, it was crazy. I didn't, I didn't really want to go there. I, I hear this all the time. All the time, they're like, the one Sunday I was planning on skipping, I showed up and God spoke. If that's true once, you should assume that's probably true every single time. Like, the, the, every single time you're like, I really don't want to go, it's probably the time you should go. It probably is. But, but what makes you go? Discipline, training, training yourself to engage in corporate worship. Next, private worship. That means we don't just worship God corporately. We worship God with our entire lives. So we gather together corporately, but we also scatter and we're also worshiping. In our jobs, our, in our work, where we live, work, and play, we're worshipers. And so if you sing songs corporately, you should sing songs privately to God. If you pray publicly, you should pray privately to God. You know how it's, Charles Spurgeon said, you know how you, you know someone doesn't know how to pray and doesn't really have a relationship with God? They're, they're public prayers. That's how you know. If someone who prays privately, worships privately, it's very clear to see it when they do it publicly. Because it, it, it looks like they're actually talking to, they believe what they're saying. It's really easy to know that uh, we don't privately worship when we, don't, when we engage in corporate worship. So oftentimes we're like, man, I don't sing to God in private, so it doesn't make sense to come corporately and sing to God corporately. I don't pray privately. It's really weird when at the end of the time tonight we're going to pray. I don't pray. It's just weird. And so we need to be disciplined and trained in both. Not, I don't say that to shame anyone. I'm saying that this is the part of discipline. If a kid doesn't know how to dribble a basketball, he's going to feel a lot of insecurities out on the basketball court when it's time his coach puts him in the game. So for us, we're disciplining, we're training ourselves so that we can have, not so that we can get a reward, not so that we can earn people's love, not so that we can look good in front of people like someone might do for their sport or their, their craft, but we're disciplining ourselves so we can know our God more. We want to worship him corporately, we want to worship him privately. Next, what helps with all of this is scripture memorization, memorizing the scripture. It's really, it, it, sometimes you don't have the Bible with you. Sometimes you don't have your app with you. Sometimes you're like, I'm taking a break from my phone. And so one, one of the ways that we can recall scripture is through the, through the discipline of memorization. Jesus tells his disciples, hey, don't worry about what to say. Uh, when it, there's going to be a time where you don't need to worry about what to say. Uh, the Holy Spirit will bring to mind what I've taught you. What Jesus is saying there is like, hey, you, you were taught something. You remembered something. There's stuff in your brain. The Holy Spirit will bring it to mind. Sometimes you're in a conversation you're with someone and, and God, the Holy Spirit, brings something to mind. It's usually because you've, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thought that you've had prior. It's a memory that you remember. It's, it's a moment where God intervened. You remember those things. 
If we want to be a blessing to other people, if we want to be encouraged perhaps even to our own souls when we're discouraged and call to mind Scripture, we must memorize it. We must memorize it. So discipline, the reason why we would discipline ourselves to memorize Scripture is not to win an award. It's so that we can call to mind the words of God that have the, that have the very, that, that Jesus says will not pass away and that give you life. You want life? Remember the word of God. Next, scripture meditation. So uh, this is thinking upon scripture. It's not some weird Eastern, you sit in a corner, do some weird pose, and you know, have Bible verses on your wall. What this is, is uh, thinking upon the scripture. The discipline of scripture meditation is the discipline of getting alone and thinking. Some of us hate that. I don't want to be in my thoughts. I don't like my thoughts. Scripture meditation can easily turn into prayer. Another way to, to, for scripture meditation, for those of you who aren't maybe verbal processors but need more time to think, a great discipline is journaling. Taking our thoughts, journaling in the mouth, writing them out. It's meditation, it's, it's processing. Maybe reading a scripture, writing out what, I'm, what, what the Lord is showing me, what I'm thinking, what, 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 what am I feeling. How does, you know, some of you need to start with, I'm reading a verse and like, this makes me feel angry. God, I'm angry. Not only are you journaling, not only are you meditating, but you're also praying. That's awesome. Next, silence and solitude. Silence and solitude is often the place where you, it's like the arena where you can do all of these. Getting alone and, get, and getting alone in, in, with God, whether it be prayer, study, Bible reading, private worship, scripture memorization, meditation, all of these things. The Lord Jesus got alone uh, for silence and solitude often, almost daily. Disciples couldn't find him all the time, and he was up on the mountain alone. And silence and solitude. We see Jesus, before he picks his 12 disciples, goes alone to pray in silence and solitude all night. He doesn't sleep. He's like, I need to be alone with the Father. I'm going to go get away. Some of us need to get away, need to unplug from technology. We all need to from time to time. It should be a, a regular discipline or rhythm in your life. Next, community. We need relationships within the church. Next, confessing sin. In community, that's where, we, that's where you would confess to someone. Not only confess to God, but we need to confess to one another. We need to confess to one another. James says when we do that, there's healing. There's blessing. There's the bonds that Satan has around you and the grips of your sin can be broken through bringing things into light in Christian community and confessing sin. Oftentimes, we have the discipline of talking about what sin we might struggle with in general terms. But the discipline of actually confessing real sin has power. And the reason why we don't do it is because we don't believe that there's power that God can overcome in confessing sin. Additionally, in our in community, while confessing sin, we can help one another repent of sin. What does that mean? Turn from sin. Next, the discipline of fasting. Fasting is not eating. That's, that's the biblical term. Some of us, I get it, we can fast from technology, we can fast from TV. Those are great things. But uh, the Bible, first and foremost, really means fasting from food. That's the first real definition of it. But anyway, no matter what you might fast from or abstain from for a season, why are you doing it? For the purpose of godliness, for the purpose of intimacy with your maker, the purpose of, of laying aside, maybe you're laying aside your phone or technology or, or whatever it may be, or even food in order, you skip lunch in order to pray. You skip lunch in order to study the Bible. You skip fasting may be an opportunity, a discipline you do to do maybe one of these other disciplines. Typically, you, you put them together. The discipline of evangelism. If we're going to make disciples, if we're going to do the first part of the Great Commission and share our faith, oftentimes it takes discipline to actually start talking to people. I'm going to discipline myself to actually engage in a conversation. Next, serving. The discipline of serving. Serving not just at church, you know, I'm not just saying that, but that's a good one, but also serving maybe your spouse, maybe serving in your home. For me, my wife, uh, one of the things, her love languages, and she feels really loved and cared for when I wash the dishes. She washes the dishes every day. I don't feel loved by that at all. Like, I'm not, I don't feel hated. I feel very neutral. But when I wash the dishes, she feels loved. Guess what I have to do? I have to discipline myself to wash the dishes. Not because I don't, I like dirty dishes. It's just like, I would, she just washes them. And I don't even think about it. But, then when, but if I discipline myself to serve my wife, it's a blessing to her. There's a discipline. Uh, she's also disciplined. Her, 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 one of her love languages is uh, acts of, not just acts of service, but um, gifts. That's my least one. You can buy me all the gifts in the world, and I'm like, awesome. That's cool. Don't feel more loved by it. 
But apparently my wife does, and so I, I do, I put schedule, I have like, I've scheduled, I have to, I have, I have reminders, I have like, I'm signed up for all these like girl magazines and shoe stuff and like clothing things, I get text messages about new deals that are going out, why? Not because I love those things, but it, I can serve my wife in this way, it's a blessing to her. So I have to discipline myself in order to serve my wife. Um, additionally, lastly, stewardship, this is Time, talent, and treasure. Stewarding your time takes discipline. Our talent, our gifts and skills. Are you stewarding your, your, your skills for the Lord Jesus? Where? Where you live, work, and play. Church, outside the church, everywhere. Are you stewarding your time? Do you, do you manage your time well? And on that, I'll also say, do you manage your energy well? Do you steward your energy? Do you steward that well? And then, do you steward your money? That, that takes discipline. All these things take discipline. This is why when we do reoccurring giving, is like, for me, I'm like, man, that's an awesome thing because it, it helps me automate a biblical generosity. It automates my stewardship because I don't have to, like, plan for it. It's a, it's a, it really helps me. From, I wanna, God, I want to give this much. This is, when my wife and I plan out our year. We're saying, hey, we're going to give this much to the church, this much monthly. Like, I just been, when I didn't, automate things or didn't discipline myself, I forgot. I'm like three months out, man, we got to triple this now. And, uh, and it just was, was binding to me. There's tools that we've been given uh, in all of these things to help all of these disciplines be a blessing, not just a burden. And also, I, we want to be good stewards, not because uh, we want to earn anything from God, but we, because we, we love God. We love Jesus. We love his mission. And so those are a lot of tools some of you do all of them, some of you do some of them, some of you God wants you to grow in, in some. And so tonight's discussion uh, in large part will be around these tools. But we got to remember the reason why these are, tool, these are tools, they're on your belt to help you. I've learned something in life that if you, if you have the right tools, any project around the home is pretty easy. But when you have the wrong tools, I don't know how many times I've tried to put together something that needed power tools with a, just a screwdriver. It's just awful. Some of us are walking around and living the Christian life with just a screwdriver when God has given us some power tools. Let's use them. Some of us need to learn how to use them. And so hopefully, by the grace of God in our conversations, we can grow and be helped towards that. Um, additionally, on your notes, you should see, and for further study on this subject, there are three books. Number one, uh, The Disciplines of a Godly Man. I have it up here if you want to come look at it later. Um, um, but I wrote it there too. This one's of a godly woman. Those two are my, those are the two recommendations I would make. This is what they look like. Those, I would recommend every single person. If you want to further study, these are the two books. They're phenomenal. They, they, they showcase all of these things, tools that I've talked about in a different way, honestly, in a more communal, uh, in, in a more uh, everyday life, practically uh, type of way. So I'd recommend those, for, one for guys, one for ladies. Um, and then uh, The Spiritual Disciplines of a Christian Life by uh, Donald Whitney. Those are, these are three great books um, that, that speak to all of these. And they're, they're, the point in all of these is not that we would just do these things to earn anyone's righteousness or to prove anything, but simply for the purpose of loving Jesus and making him known to other people. So um, let me pray for you as you get into your groups, and we'll go in for discussion. Lord Jesus, we ask for your blessing on our time now. Uh, bless us as we discuss. Holy Spirit, use our words to edify, encourage, and build us up. May we see where, Jesus, you're speaking and, at, and what you're asking of us, and may we willfully walk in that. Lord, may we see that your grace is abundant. Our sin is much, but your mercy is more. We love you, Jesus, and it's your name I pray. Amen.